reoriented the block on the engine stand so that one bank is vertical. When you're setting the gap, you can use the piston to press the ring down square like so, press it an inch or an inch and a half down in, and then use your feeler gauge like this to measure the gap. Now I've already set these, but I just want to show the process that you slide it in here and it's a little dark down there, but I'm, I'm putting it between the ends of the, of the ring. And then you will file the end of the rings to achieve that gap. Again, there are a number of ways you can do this. I'm using a hand file and then placing one end here and just moving up and back like so. After you do that, there's going to be some burrs here, so make sure that you touch it up on the ends, both sides, like this, and on the ends here as well. Once you do that, you can also put it up to light like this and press them together to make sure you're filing square both in both orientations and square it up if, if that doesn't seem to be the case. Then put it in the cylinder, measure your gap, and file as necessary. We have the piston rings temporarily installed in the bores. The reason we do that is that the end gap in the rings can vary about three thousandths for only one thousandths of an inch variation in the bore diameter. So when we're file fitting things, we want to make sure we match them because even if the bore to bore difference is only half a thousandths, we're looking at one to two thousandths difference in the end gap. So we keep those matched, and then we also want to match the pistons to the respective bores in case some of the bores are half to one thousandths different. So we'll measure these pistons. We'll also measure the bores. The way we measure the bores is we draw out a sketch like this, and you can see I've already started. You can try and measure it directly with a vernier caliper. If you have snap gauges and a micrometer, this is a more accurate way of doing it. Okay, we've taken the bore measurements jotted them down here and you can see they all came out the same except for a couple that were half a thousand small. We'll measure the pistons to see if there's any that are far from nominal. If you're using a vernier caliper, um, well first of all make sure you're measuring on the piston skirt. So this area here you want to measure across this area not on the crown that's a smaller diameter so you want to measure on the skirt here. If you're using the vernier caliper one easy way to do it make sure you're getting an accurate measurement as you place it flush on this part of the piston here. Okay, and you can see that I've got it square across, perpendicular to the wrist pin, sitting flush, and we're measuring at 4027. Looks like right at 4027. So we'll jot that down for all the cylinders, or excuse me, all the pistons, and see if there's any large pistons or small pistons that we want to match the bores. These have been taken. Two of the pistons came out consistently half a thousand smaller diameter than the rest. Uh, works works out nicely because we have two cylinders that came out half a thousand smaller. So we'll label them as I've done over here, cylinder three and four. All the other pistons can go wherever they need to go. Um, this is important at this stage because the rods are going to be mated to the pistons. And if you look, the pistons are directional with this arrow pointing to the front of the engine. And the rods are also directional. So you'll notice if you look closely that there's a small chamfer on this side of the rod and there's a large chamfer on this side. The large chamfer has to go against the counterweight. But you can see we're going to have two rods per journal and we need the chamfer of the rod to be next to the counterweight and we need the arrow on the top of the piston to be pointing toward the front of the engine. So we need to Keep that in mind when we're assembling the rods to the piston so that everything is oriented correctly. And then, of course, if the pistons have to go in particular cylinders, then we have to make sure that the rod is oriented on that piston so that it can go in that hole next to that counterweight. So first we select the cylinder that we're going to assemble. I'm going to select cylinder number six right here. And we can see that based on the alignment with the crankshaft journal, that the front of the engine is this way and that the rod chamfer will need to be toward the rear of the engine. That's where the counterweight is located. So that means that the arrow on the piston will need to be opposite the chamfer on the rod. Lubricate the bushing. I'll, you can use card cleaner to remove any 
rust inhibitor that the manufacturer may have put on here that might be on the bushing. So lubricate the bushing, lubricate the wrist pin, verify your arrow versus your chamfer. So I can see here, you probably can't see, but I can see that the chamfer is on this side, the lesser chamfer is on this side. So we're going to mount an arrow forward this direction. Pull the wrist pin through. Okay. And just move the lubricant around a little bit. Okay. Now we need to install the retaining clips. Put the open end in to the groove. And then curl the clip together so that it compresses into a smaller diameter. Just gently pop it into the groove. You'll hear that audible click. Do the other side. We have to do this before the rings because on the 347, the rings intersect the wrist pin. Verify that there's that the wrist pin will float at least ten thousandths between the two retaining clips, and that the retaining clips are fully seated. Now, again, this is three forty seven specific parts. We need to install the spacer ring. It has a dot on it. Make sure that you guys can see that. There's a dot, a dimple, really, I should call it, and the dimple needs to go down into this space that keeps this spacer ring from rotating around. Then we'll do this, this center oil ring first. And the documentation that comes with your rings will tell you uh, if there's a particular orientation that they'd like to be in. So this one, we're going to align the open end to be crosswise from the wrist pin. And we'll use our awl to kind of get things to move this spacer ring down. Next, we'll install the top and bottom rings uh, for the oil control ring, about the nine, uh, ten, 10 and a half position, bottom side of the oil control ring. The second one goes on the top side of the oil control ring in the seven o'clock position. Everything's still moving freely, so you know everything's installed correctly. Now we're going to go get the rings from cylinder number six. Install the second ring first, bevel side down, or as indicated on your documentation of came with your rings. So we want this one to go. So that the open end is here per the documentation when the front of the engine arrow is pointed towards me. So use your reverse pliers to spread the ring. Carefully move it around the piston. Being very careful not to scratch the OD of the piston. And finally, the top ring, which will be 180 degrees from the second ring. Okay, everything's moving freely, so no binding. Everything's installed correctly and oriented correctly for the arrow. And now we have a completed piston rod ring assembly. So we'll want to now mark. So this was these rings were in cylinder six, and this piston works best for cylinder six. So we can just mark on here six in a couple of places. 